Hey, hey, Bankless Nation. It is time for another Bankless panel. This one I am super excited about. Couldn't be more excited about. This is the ETH staking services panel. David, the fact that we can even do this is so massive. After mm -hmm. all the time we've been waiting for ETH staking, I came in December of 2020 and I just looked at the stats over 6 million ETH staked, 6.3 million. We were just talking about this on the roll-up, David, about like how at the very beginning when uh, ETH2 went live and staking went live, we were worried that we wouldn't get enough stake. It took like <laughs> half a million mm -hmm. to launch the chain and there was mm -hmm. some concern that we wouldn't get enough. Here we are with 6.3 million. And we've got an expert panel. Why don't you tell us about the panel, David? Yeah, we have uh, the three staking as a service uh, products, companies, teams, projects out there. We have uh, Coinbase, we have Alita, uh, Lido Finance, and then we also have Rocket Pool. And these are three different approaches to staking as a service or ETH staking. And so we are bringing in the people that are building out different projects, approaching ETH staking differently to ask them about their product uh, and ask them about like the trade-offs that each product has made. And hopefully the, the listeners and the viewers come away with a little bit more information as to the world of staking from the, the staking as a service uh, perspective. And maybe staking as a service is the right product for them. Maybe they want to stake themselves. But we are going to find out all the different um, you know, variables and nuances and trade-offs that go into the decision-making behind e-staking. Guys, this is all about options, optionality. Of course, if you can stake at home, like stake at home, stake yourself. But this is another option for you. And as David said, it's kind of the spectrum of like um, custodied to, to more decentralized and less custodied. We're, we're covering it all today. And uh, these are really the experts in the field. Of course, these are not all of the staking service providers out there, but we picked these three because we feel like they, they represent um, different points on uh, on the spectrum of self custody versus and more decentralized versus m more custodial and a bit more centralized and kind of the full trade off mix. So strap in, guys. This is going to be a super exciting panel. Before we begin, we want to thank the sponsors that made this Bankless episode possible. Balancer is a powerful platform for flexible automated market makers. Typical AMMs just have two tokens inside of one liquidity pool, which can lead to fractured liquidity across the many pairs in DeFi. With Balancer, you can access the full power of multiple tokens inside of one single AMM, which unlocks an entirely new playing field of possibility. This makes Balancer an awesome building block for so many different use cases. Balancer pools can make asset indices, but instead of paying fees to portfolio managers, Balancer lets you collect the fees from traders who use your portfolio for liquidity. Additionally, Balancer smart pools can be programmed to have properties that change according to predetermined rules, such as changing the swap fee based on market conditions, or even liquidity bootstrapping pools, which can help you launch and distribute your token with day one liquidity. At Bankless, we use a liquidity bootstrapping pool to sell our BAP t-shirts to much success. Balancer V2 brings powerful new features that makes your money work even harder for you. In V2, idle tokens are capable of generating yield in DeFi without sacrificing liquidity in the pool using Balancer's asset managers. Balancer's vault architecture lets you trade between Balancer pools at a fraction of the cost versus trading on other platforms. Balancer's mission is to become the primary source of liquidity in DeFi by providing the most flexible and powerful platform for asset management and decentralized exchange. Dive into the balancer pools at app.balancer.fi. Gemini is the world's most trusted cryptocurrency exchange. I've been a customer of Gemini since I first got into crypto in 2017, and it's been my main exchange of choice to make my crypto buys and sells. Gemini is available in all 50 states and in over 50 countries worldwide. And on Gemini, there are markets for over 30 various different crypto assets, including many of the hot DeFi tokens. And it's one of the few exchanges that has liquid DAI markets. Gemini just launched their Earn program, where you can earn up to 7.4% interest on 26 various crypto assets. If you're tired of paying fees in DeFi, or you don't want to worry about DeFi exploits, but you still want to earn interest on your crypto assets, Gemini Earn is the product for you. Another product I'm stoked to get my hands on is the Gemini Crypto Back Credit Card, which gives you 3% cash back on all of your purchases, but paid to you in your preferred crypto asset. When I get my Gemini credit card, I'm going to make sure that I get my cash back in ETH. So whenever I buy something, I get a little bit of ETH bonus back to me at the same time. 
You can open up a free account in under three minutes at gemini.com slash go bankless. And if you trade more than $100 within the first 30 days after sign up, you'll be gifted a free $15 Bitcoin bonus. Check them out at gemini.com slash go bankless. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Banking Staking Services panel. We have a packed panel for you. These are uh, the, the Bankless Staking space. Service panel. Just well, no, we 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 are not. Bankless is not offering staking services. Ah. It's on the Bankless Media uh, <laughs> yeah. channel. That that's why it's Bankless, <laughs> David. All right. So let me introduce the panelists for you here. We've got three staking service companies represented, best in the business. We've got Coinbase. We've got Lido. We've got Rocket Pool. Um, Ejaz is the product manager at Coinbase. We've got Vasili. He is the co-founder of Lido. And we've got Darren, who is the general manager of Rocket Pool. We are going to get into staking services first. Everyone, welcome. How's it going? Going well. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, guys, great to be here. It is so cool to have you guys. Uh, I think um, it was such a bear to schedule this, actually because all of us reside in different time zones in different corners of the of the world. This is maybe one of the most difficult uh, bankless panels that we've ever scheduled. So like the timing is inconvenient for just about everybody on this panel, except maybe David, he's yeah, smiling. I, I'm okay. in the middle here. <laughs> he, he's doing okay. Uh, so I appreciate right, you guys. It's great for me. Well, I, well it's, it's good for Australia too. So it's good for Darren, but we appreciate you guys making time for this. Um, it's uh, it, we've never done a, a, a kind of a staking episode that's dedicated to it. So I think there's a lot to unpack for the bankless nation. I guess maybe I'll just I'll just throw an overview out here. Both Lido, Rocket Pool, and Coinbase, all three of them, they're all staking as a service products. Each of them have staking as a service products. Each uh, approaches ETH staking a little bit differently. And as with everything in this world in crypto, there are trade offs when it comes to ETH staking of the various approaches. We, we want to dive into some of those trade-offs and actually understand um, the uh, the points on the spectrum where you guys are coming at uh, it from, from a staking solution perspective so that we can give bankless listeners some information uh, when they are deciding who to stake with. Um, let's start with some high-level introductions from, from each of you and your overall approaches. I want to start with Lido, uh, Vasily, with you. I, how does Lido approach ETH staking Vasili? So what things are you guys prioritizing over other things? What trade-offs have you made in your staking services design? Vasili, why don't you kick things off? Um, so Lido is a DAO that builds liquid staking uh, on different blockchains, including and starting with Ethereum. We have headquarters on Ethereum. That's our like homeland, heartland. So um, liquid staking means that people uh, stake with Lido and get a token return, and that token can be traded or um, uh, used as collateral or uh, used in other ways. Uh, it's liquid and transferable. So um, we think that uh, for liquid staking, uh, there is a, some kind of uh, witness tax more situation, like with stable coins or ROPA coins, like. WBTC or uh, stablecoin, there will be one uh, one big provider of, of the thing and uh, other uh, smaller. So what we think we're doing is the best possible solution for liquid staking that can win, that is actually can be uh, at, uh, at the same time a, a winning solution and also decentralized, say for Ethereum and uh, easy to use. So that's what we build in here. That that requires. Uh, no, I'm sorry. One one minute more. That requires like a number to, to make. Like to launch uh, earlier, we had to use a threshold signature for withdrawal. That means that uh, currently Lido um, deposits are uh, like under uh, a risk of uh, collusion for threshold signature cosigners and. Uh, uh, we we've got the permissionless uh, permissioned uh, validator set, uh, not operator set for for Lido, uh, to make it safe through the initial period of uh, ETH when uh, Ethereum staking when uh, uh, the protocol is under development yet. 
Yeah, so, and we definitely want to go more into details on on uh, Lido specifically because I think it's got some of the most nuanced uh, position on the various spectrum. But Vasily, you emphasize liquid staking, and importantly, Lido is the only product that has a staking derivative token yet out onto the market. Would you say the uh, main focus or main priority of the Lido ecosystem is really to produce that secondary uh, staking token? The, the uh, tokenized deposits of ETH. Would you guys say that that is your main priority or main focus? Um, so we we want to make a liquid staking that is uh, easy to use, stay safe, and decentralized. So that's that's uh, uh, that's our mission. That's our goal. Yeah, we we focus on liquid staking. Yes. Cool. All right, guys. Let's go ahead and move on to uh, Rocket Pool. Rocket Pool. So, Darren, can, tell us a little bit about Rocket Pool, how Rocket Pool works, and the trade offs that it has made in order to produce its staking as a service uh, uh, system. So, our approach aligns with the principles of Ethereum. So, we are fully decentralized, non custodial, and open source. So, essentially, Rocket Pool aligns the interests of people who have Ether, um, but don't want to run a node, we call them stakers, and people who have 16 ETH, but have the technical capability to operate a node. So we call them node operators. So our smart contracts match a node operator with 16 ETH from stakers to make up the 32 ETH needed for Ethereum staking. Um, as a node operator, uh, they only need 16 ETH, which is great. Uh, they earn commission on the matched ETH, which is even better. Um, and they also get RPO rewards, which RPO is our token, um, but they get that those rewards for providing RPO as collateral. Uh, as a staker, uh, it, it'll be super simple. So uh, you essentially just swap ETH for our liquid staking token, which is our ETH, and you can participate in all the DeFi glory. Uh, and then at any time you can swap it back for Ethereum plus the rewards. And that's essentially how that, that kind of works. Very good. We'll get into all of this some more with Rocket Pool. Uh, I want, want to throw it over to uh, Ejaz with Coinbase. What is Coinbase's approach to staking? What have you guys really optimized for Ejaz? Yeah, so I think there's really two core principles we consider when we approach our, our staking products. Uh, and one of them is ease of use. So a simple UX, minimum barrier to adoption. And then I think the second one is security or safety. And from there, we do our best to optimize between the two. For example, how do we achieve minimum risk exposure without compromising the product experience for a user? Um, so if we take examples of previous staking products um, that we already have launched, for example, Tezos and, and Cosmos staking for our retail users, the user experience is pretty intuitive. So you deposit into your account and you can start earning APY periodically. You don't have to worry about running the infrastructure or delegating or anything. For ETH2, uh, as, as you all know, there, there are some very unique challenges that differentiates this from any typical uh, staking product. For example, there's a minimum 32 ETH that you need to deposit typically if you're running this on your own. Um, you need to manage hundreds, potentially thousands of validators instead of just a few. And there's a lockup for stakers until phase 1.5. There's massive risk uh, of slashing, correlated slashing, and not to forget like the centralization risks. So we need to take all of this into account when designing these products. And I'd say that the kind of core problem that we've looked to prioritize above others in our staking solution for, for ETH2 is de-risking the staking implementation as much as we can. And I think that means decentralizing different layers of the infra stack as much as we can. And we can get into this later um, if that works. Um, but ETH is one of our largest assets held in the custody. So we need to make sure that user funds are safe. Uh, there are a few trade-offs that this creates. Um, largely, a lot of them happen under the hood. So it's not actually exposed to the user. But one public example is we've launched a wait list and we've been gradually rolling people off of it as we scale up our service. We, we really want to make sure that uh, our implementation can handle the volumes we're putting it through and that our quality of service is, is maintained. Ijaz, just a quick follow-up on this. I, I'm curious, since uh, Coinbase has been staking with other proof-of-stake networks in the past, what what would you say is are sort of the main distinctions between other proof-of-stake networks versus uh, ETH2 right now? What, what are some of the differences, the contrast points? Yeah, I, I would, I'd say it's the 
it's the two points that I, I, I mentioned earlier. Um, let's take Tezos, for example, right? Um, the way that it, it generally works is it's simple enough to delegate uh, Tezos tokens to a baker, which is like a staker, right? And you typically only need to operate one or two of these things to accommodate quite a large amount of, of principal. Um, and the slashing risk is, is, is much lower than ETH, right? You can't get 100% slashing with Tezos. Now, when you compare this to ETH2, you have a minimum deposit of 32 ETH per validator. So now if you wanna scale this up massively, you now have to run thousands of these things, right? And um, it's a non-trivial task to kind of maintain all of these validators to make sure that they're upkept at the same kind of quality and security bars that you have for like some of these other staking chains, right? Um, and I think just like in general, like the principle is so much more higher, the staking and slashing risk is so much more higher. So uh, there's a lot more, if you the pun, at stake uh, with ETH2 versus some of these other chains. All right, very cool. So I, I, I think... Um... I'm starting to hear some of the priorities you guys are making. Uh, you know, Coinbase talking about user experience, ease of use, UX. Um, Lido talking about uh, liquidity, making sure there's liquid. Um, Rocket Pool talking about decentralization, making sure this is open, permissionless. Um, some of these things are starting to come through. Let, let's turn to business model for for a second. I want to stay with Ejaz on this um, because Coinbase, of course, just went public. Um, obviously, uh, you've got shareholders, uh, they're, lo they're looking for profits, this sort of thing. Um, what is Coinbase's business model when it comes to ETH staking? How is Coinbase expecting to make money off this? And, and give us some guidance on the fee structure that prospective stakers can expect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so put quite simply, for our retail consumers staking through our main app, uh, we take a percentage of the rewards that they earn from their principal that's staked. Uh, currently, that fee is set at 25%. Um, we follow a similar model with institutional clients, but it varies um, depending on client and chain and through the path that they might stake with us. But for retail customers, it's 25% uh, of rewards. Very good. And, and quick poll here, because I'm curious off the top of my head. Um, Ejaz, is, is uh, Coinbase staking available to everyone or is it kind of a select group right now? It's not, is it generally available? So, kind of waitlist beta ish. Yeah. So, yeah. So, for um, our existing assets that we have right now, um, Cosmos, Tezos, and ETH2 for our retail consumers, um, Cosmos and uh, Tezos are rolling out to the majority of the geographies that we support. There are obviously some geographies that we can't always support, jurisdictions within the US that we can't support, but we're working very adamantly to be able to provide support to the users there. For ETH2, we've taken a more gradual approach. Um, so we're currently serving um, users within the US uh, off of our waitlist, uh, and we're very soon hoping to expand into international geographies as well. So as we get into the world of uh, things on chain with the world of, of Lido and, and Rocket Pool, we still have business models in the world of on chain economics, but they're a little bit different. And so I want to throw this question to uh, Vasily. How does Le what's Lido's uh, business model? Where does it capture value? Who who gets to earn rewards? Uh, and and uh, what is overall the the business model for 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 Lido? Oh, Vasily, you are muted. Yeah, uh, so LIDAR is uh, uh, pretty straightforward in that regard. Uh, we've got um, the people uh, stake either with us, uh, they receive stake tether tokens and they receive rewards. And uh, LIDAR uh, takes 10% uh, fee. That 10% fee is getting cut into uh, three directions basically. One is uh, paying out the node operators. Uh, because they do all the work uh, here in validating uh, the the network, et cetera, et cetera, and they have to be paid. Uh, and uh, currently, it's uh, uh, half of that ten percent fee, so five percent goes to not operators, and the rest goes to uh, to light the treasury that can be used for different things. For uh, uh, for example, buying cover for stakers, uh, like we, we we do it at this point, and. Uh, uh, the the um, maybe the development uh, the uh, personal costs etc uh, etc et so uh, it's uh, 
spending is uh, voted on by the uh, LDO token holders. Very cool. Okay, so you said they were split off into three directions. One direction goes to the node operator, operators, one goes into the community treasury. What was the third? Um, um, the um, cover, uh, the, uh, one uh, goes to the treasury straight and one goes to the to buy the cover. So. Ah, okay. So there's like a little bit of a, uh, an insurance fund kind of like baked into the Lido, uh, Lido system. Yeah, it's been discussed right now because it's been um, uh, <coughs> very expensive to buy a cover lately and we might to uh, switch to uh, uh, some kind of uh, self cover like Avo or something uh, does, but uh, that's currently under discussion right now. And Vasily, when you when you say node operators, validators is also another term for that. Is one and the same? Yes or no? Um, so when talking about Ethereum, uh, we use node operators because uh, validator is like one private key that is uh, no, valid uh, validating the uh, one, one, one basically stream on signatures. Uh, so Ethereum has um, uh, what I don't know two 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 hundred uh, thousand validators right now, uh, but uh, only maybe like a thousand node operators. Uh, ah. So to, to to be completely clear here, we use node operators as entities that manage validators, individual validators. Right, right. So there are are a handful of node operators in the Lido system. I like I think ten or eleven, but there are thousands of potential validators because that's the number of the deposits, yeah. the ether deposits into the Lido contracts. Yeah, we've got nine right now, but we uh, oh, are playing okay. an expansion. Okay, cool. All right, let's turn the conversation to Rocket Pool and Darren. Darren, can you kind of give us the broad, like, overarching? What is the business model or the crypto economic structure of the Rocket Pool system? Where does the value transfer? What's the fee structure? Tell us about these details. So within Rocket Pool, value is captured in two ways. So we have um, Ethereum fees from stakers, which I'll kind of touch on in a minute, um, and then RPL rewards. So RPL is our token and it has a kind of an inflation rate of 5%. And we use that to incentivize actors within the protocol to work in its best interest. So to break that down to the specific actors, so we've got stakers who receive Ethereum staking rewards from the beacon chain, as you'd expect. Uh, then we have node operators who are really the hero of our story. They provide the hardware and skill to operate a node. So they receive the majority of the value created by the protocol. They receive, uh, they earn um, beacon chain rewards, uh, commission from stakers, uh, and then they get this share of the RPO inflation as well before providing RPO collateral. Uh, we also have two DAOs. We have an Oracle DAO, which is a kind of a broad group of high profile Ethereum stakeholders um, from kind of three target areas. So community, ecosystem, and industry, uh, they play a supporting role. So essentially they oracle information from the beacon chain into our smart contracts. And for that, they get a share of the kind of RPO inflation. The protocol DAO, which is the other DAO, uh, is basically to fund open source development of Rocket Pool going forward. So it gets a small kind of share of the Rocket Pool inflation to kind of drive that forward. Um, in actual fact, we've actually got a, a really great explainer series uh, on our medium um, about everything about how Rocket Pool works, specifically our tokenomics. Um, and our fantastic community have actually uh, put together some videos. So it's made it really easy to digest. In terms of the fees, so node operators don't pay any fees, but they earn a dynamic kind of commission structure. So mm -hmm. It's based on supply and demand because we're a decentralized protocol. We have to kind of uh, promote participation when we need it. So we have a commission structure that um, varies between 5% and 20%, but we target 10% essentially. So stakers um, or RF holders, they actually get um, or they actually pay an average across the whole protocol, So um, which should be around 10%. Okay, so uh, with the, you, you have the RPL token inflation to pay out certain parts of the Rocket Pool ecosystem, but the only people that are actually capturing uh, ETH fees, fees denominated in Ether, are the node operators. So the Rocket Pool DAO doesn't charge any, any Ether fees. It's just the node operators, right? That's exactly right. And we found that that's the kind of uh, you know, least... 
um, rent seeking sort of uh, option. Um, so we, we kind of stay out of it and uh, we the money goes to the node operators because essentially they are doing all the work to, to, to put this together. You said there's a uh, supply demand balance equilibrium that needs to be struck. And I'm kind of reminded of the issuance schedule of Ether, the asset as a function of whether there are a lot of nodes on the system. If there's a lot of validators on Ethereum, Ethereum will actually issue more Ether, but rates will be more competitive and therefore be lower and then vice versa. If there's not a lot of validators in the available in the system, Ethereum will issue less Ether, but it will be more rewards per validator. And that's how kind of Ethereum finds balance equilibrium between the supply and demand of security. Rocket Pool kind of follows that same sort of structure, right? Exactly, yeah. So um, if the uh, demand strips capacity, um, for uh, so basically, if there's more in our um, Harish deposit pool, then we have capacity uh, on the the operator node operator side. Then the commission rates um, kind of go up, um, so that it kind of incentivizes people to participate within the protocol, or and so um, level it out. So essentially, we get this equilibrium exactly as you said. So Darren, because I asked Ejaz uh, the, the, this question, I'm going to ask you the same question. I know, I know, Lido is is live and rolling right now, accepting um, uh, stakers. Uh, I, and um, sounds like Coinbase is in kind of a, a limited rollout right now, rolling out fast. What is the status of of Rocket Pool? When can folks start staking with Rocket Pool? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we're not on mainnet yet, as you as, as you've said but we are one step away. So uh, we will be releasing our release candidate to the Prada testnet on the 2nd of August. And then following on from then, we'll go to, to mainnet. So this is a massive milestone for us. Uh, and we're really excited to be able to finally share the kind of the work that we've been doing um, with the broader community. Are you sharing that right now? So is that is that sort of an August date <laughs> that you're sharing now? I, I wish, I wish. <laughs> I wish I could give that to you, but we actually announced it uh, earlier on in the week. Just, just like okay, that's so. good. I, I didn't. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Congrats on that. <laughs> we do. We do love you guys, but no. <laughs> <laughs> breaking news for some, but maybe some already saw that. Um, <laughs> All right, you know, I think this next question is is uh, really important. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep with uh, you, Darren, and, and Rocket Pool because there is um, sort of with, with staking, there is, I guess, incentive alignment and. Um, you know, a, a selfish profit motive for the individual staker, right? But then there's also this public good that all stakers in aggregate are providing to Ethereum, the network. Let's not forget why we stake. Let's not forget why we are validating. It is for the continued decentralization of this Ethereum ecosystem, this Ethereum economy is super important. So I'm gonna ask you this question. If Rocket Pool is successful, how does your project impact the centralization or decentralization of Ethereum, that, that public good that I was just talking about? Yeah, so obviously we spent a considerable amount of time building this decentralized staking protocol because we strongly believe that centralization is a huge risk. And you can uh, that problem you can see in the beacon chain uh, deposit address graphs. Um, with Rocket Pool, anyone can operate a node. So uh, essentially we're going to be mobilizing a decentralized army of individual node operators to perform validation. So Rocket Pool is permissionless. So anyone with 16 ETH and 1.6 ETH worth of RPL can operate a node and be in the Rocket Pool uh, protocol. So from an Ethereum perspective, we are no different than solo staking. We provide the same level of decentralization. Um, the aim is to have thousands of individual node operators kind of operating within the Rocket Pool protocol. And why is that important? Just refresh everyone on why decentralization yeah. of Ethereum is important. So there's a there's a few um, um, benefits to that. So first of all, there is no um, centralized control. So um, in in it, in proof of stake, it's very important, particularly with MEV. <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, maybe MEV, but um, uh, so with MEV, if you have centralized operators, uh, the problem gets worse, much, much worse. Um, so there's a few things like that. There's also uh, just a resistant, a kind of, uh, it's more robust 
the network is more robust because you have different setups, different machines. Um, and so you can't have like a whole part of the network that gets destroyed and, and uh, Ethereum goes down. It'll just keep running because uh, you're so decentralized. We'll indeed talk a bit more about MEV. That is maximum extractable value. You've also heard of minor extractable value. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I want to throw the same question to you, uh, Vasily. So uh, what's Lido's take on this? How does Lido's project impact the, the centralization or decentralization of Ethereum? What's your philosophy here, Vasily? Uh, so um, uh, I firmly believe that with Lido, uh, the decentralization of Ethereum is better than without it. So uh, we we are building like not the best solution, we build the best possible solution, the best solution that can actually win. And that's like a big difference. There are a lot of staking models that uh, give bit better decentralization and ideal work where people use them. But uh, we, uh, the staking is a product, product that can be better on worse and there is a baseline liquid staking uh, product that is already pretty good it's liquid staking offered by exchanges and we've seen it in in the wild in the other staking economies of to exchanges to take uh, a big share just because it's convenient and uh, while it's custodial it's uh, it's convenient to use and uh, easier uh, and uh, that's like pretty pretty good baseline. So uh, decentralized protocols should be uh, competitive uh, and preferably better. They have the the means to be better by being vertically integrated into DeFi and uh, neutral and uh, mm, uh, decentralizedly uh, uh, governable. And uh, well, they 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 can be better for for both stakers and for the protocols, but uh, there has to be trade off made to, to make them competitive. And uh, I think that uh, uh, without without LIDAR, uh, uh, Ethereum would be in a worse place than it is. For example, we've got like uh, about 10% share right now of uh, Ether that is distributed between uh, nine node operators. Uh, the, uh, Kraken Exchange has got like 12% 12, 12 or 40% of, 40 of uh, all is staked right now uh, by, by themselves. Um, so uh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's what I think about it. Silly, let me run this by you and, and uh, make sure that you agree with, with uh, my take on, on Lido. Um, uh, Lido is a, it's a, it's a DAO model, right? And so there's com community governments, community treasury, community ownership. And so your, your take is that there's a certain amount of trade-offs that need to be made as a staking as a service. Uh, you said that staking as a service is a product, a product that needs to be provided. Uh, and so the, the trade-off with the uh, currently nine uh, validators that are operating in Lido in, in the future, a few more, that is uh, democratizing more access to more people who are able to stake more ETH because of Lido. Uh, and that community-owned, community-operated kind of Lido DAO is, is how we uh, manage that tr those trade-offs between um, fewer, fewer uh, validators, but more access to staking services. Would you agree with that characterization? Um, mm, I, I'd say that the, the, the DAO is more, is more like guiding force here. So it's, it's not uh, like a final arbiter here. It's, it's guiding the, uh, the Lido through the initial period where the uh, beacon chain uh, uh, is about as, uh, as useful as a potato where you can stake and you can not stake. And uh, that's like what, what, what you can do. And the spec is changing uh, that, that, that the, 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 like the construction side, uh, you, you be a hot head <laughs> going through construction side and LIDAR is that hard, hard, uh, governance is that hard, hard head for now. So, uh, but the, like the final form of liquid staking that can actually uh, win is uh, first ossified, uh, not, not upgradable, not governable, uh, well, slightly governable maybe, but uh, not, 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 not very. And it has to be permissionless uh, with uh, not operators. It should be, uh, shouldn't be a white list. Uh, it shouldn't be a, like a, a limited amount of not operators, but that can only happen when, when we, the, the, the playing field uh, is not uh, like changed under you, right? Uh, so our trade-off is not that we have a white list forever of small number of operators, it's that we have to, uh, to launch 
uh, on a minimal amount of feature that can actually make a good staking product that is sufficiently decentralized for now and uh, have changes, uh, chances to, to become better in that in the future. And LIDAR DAO is the guiding for that will guide LIDAR from like a good product uh, on the start to the best possible product uh, and best for Ethereum, not only for stakers at the end. The, the beacon chain on its own is about as useful as a potato. That, that That's a quote <laughs> I'm going to highlight and take away from this conversation for sure. Um, Ejaz, how about you? So uh, give the case for why an exchange makes for a good staking services provider, and specifically on this topic of centralization versus decentralization of Ethereum as a public good. Yeah. Um, firstly, I think it's a great question. And I actually echo a lot of what Darren and Vasily uh, has said so far. Like, listen, Ethereum is at its best, the most decentralized, the more decentralized that it is, right? Um, and I think there's often this notion or perception of exchanges that, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to be the, the big bad wolves that, that try and centralize everything. And uh, I, I'm here to say that that's not most definitely not always the case when we approach our products, uh, particularly with Ethereum. Um, and I just think that like, Incentives are just different um, for uh, exchanges in the way, but it's definitely aligned with the, uh, the kind of principles with Ethereum in general. So in terms of, you know, whether we're towards a centralized and decentralized philosophy, we want to make sure we de decentralize Ethereum as much as we can, right? But if I go back to one of the original core principles, um, to one of the earlier, uh, earlier questions that um, you asked in terms of like, what we consider when we design these staking products, it's ease of use. And so we wanna make sure that we balance this decentralization for users with easy accessibility to be able to stake. Um, um, my kind of thinking and, and like Coinbase's thinking as well is, um, yes, one could go out and set up their infrastructure themselves at home um, and they're encouraged to do so, but often it's quite tough to do so uh, for anyone that holds 32 ETH or, or more. Um, and so we want to be able to balance and create a solution that that enables that. Uh, and there's ways that we push forward that decentralized ethos. Uh, I mentioned it earlier and we can dig into it now or, or later if you like, but um, we look at like our infrastructure stack when we do that. Um, I don't think just because Coinbase is um, the company that offers ETH2 staking for our users, uh, that means that we are, we should be considered a single uh, infrastructure entity, right? I think there's ways that you can decentralize that, whether it's using multiple clients, whether it's using multiple staking providers. Um, and I think there's a path forward there. So definitely pro decentralization. Yeah, I think I definitely want to echo the fact that I think centralized exchanges get a bad rap when it comes to staking. That's a little bit unfair. And, and I, I want to make the case for staking inside of Coinbase or staking inside of a centralized exchange at all. Um, in the world where we uh, uh, say in like 20, 30, 40, whatever, the future, and that Coinbase has never ever, or any centralized exchange, has never ever maliciously gone after Ethereum. Well, in this world, which I think is actually the most likely world, then all of these centralized exchanges and Coinbase, what they have done is they have made the ease of Ether distribution as maximally accessible as possible. And so, uh, you know, I don't really think there's no f reason for in any uh, any centralized exchange's self-interest to harm the network that is that is the staking network. Therefore, if that version of the future plays out, then all Coinbase would have done is they've been able to democratize more and more of the Ether staking and Ether issuance to a broader and broader set of people. Because that's really what Coinbase's core competency is. It's user aggregation and ease of use. And so, you know, so long as the incentives of Coinbase plays out, then they will actually be one of the most democratizing forces of Ether staking rewards of all time. Uh, and so I, I think that's, that's a, uh, a decent perspective about centralized staking that I don't see or hear, hear echoed all that much. Yeah, I mean, you, listen, you, you honestly hit that right on the head, right? Like the ethos or foundational ethos for blockchains are decentralization, right? We've seen that with Bitcoin, we've seen it with Ethereum. And like our mission at Coinbase is to create an open financial ecosystem, right? To enable paths and funnels for users to be able to access all of this, right? And, you know, there's brand and reputational risk that is tied to all of this, right? Um, and I think like when we build these products, it's definitely with the mindset 
of enabling this wider decentralization. Um, and it's through the aggregation effort, it's through ease of use, it's through a safe and simple means for the majority of users that may not want to you know, set up and run their own infrastructure. And, and that's really what we, we want to help um, pitch and create for. I want to turn the panel to, to this question. We'll, we'll continue with you, Ijaz, for, for the moment. This is around like validating an architecture, like specifically who is doing mm. the validating. And uh, that's a question for Coinbase. So it seems like the model for Coinbase versus um, both Rocket Pool and Lido here is, is that Coinbase is sort of running the, the, the validating infrastructure. I want to ask about that. But then I want to ask like more broadly, if I'm staking my ETH with Coinbase, what, a tr what trust assumptions, in what ways do I have to trust yeah. Coinbase? I have to give up my private keys, right? And we, we, we've heard, you know, not your keys, not your crypto sort of thing. What are the other trust mm -hmm. assumptions here? Yeah, so um, let me take the first part of your question and then um, can, can touch on the last. Um, yeah, so, you know, as, as you're all aware, ETH2 staking was designed in such a way that encourages the decentralization of its inherent staking infrastructure. Like, uh, right, so like the 32 ETH minimum, uh, multiple staking clients. Uh, and so we want, really wanted to build our solution in a way that upheld this uh, whilst also making it easier for our users to stake. And so one of the core focuses uh, was to decentralize the validating part of our solution. Uh, and we can do this through a few, few ways, one of which is to use multiple staking providers that meet our levels of security and quality. Uh, this is safer. It minimizes centralized risk exposure. So we reduce the chances of triggering slashable offenses. Uh, Bison Trails, who we acquired earlier in the year, is one key uh, example of a partner. But we also focus on using multiple providers. And then in terms of, I guess, um, how our validators are incentivized for maybe things like maximum uptime and stuff like that, like we have a high bar for quality and security requirements in general for each provider that you know needs to be met before we integrate them. Um, but we also have things like uh, SLAs in place of service level agreements that ensure that our providers meet at least a minimum uh, level of service. And these can account for things like maximized uptime, using multiple staking clients, minimum overlap between providers, uh, infrastructure, et cetera. And like another way I, I like to think about incentives for, for these providers, because uh, I think it's, it's actually quite a, an interesting topic, is you know, if a provider integrates with Coinbase, that's almost guaranteed ETH flow for them to stake, right? And there's also reputational risk for providers itself that we use if they don't maintain a quality of service. Um, so, so that's kind of like the, the outlook there. And then in terms of, I can go on about the infrastructure, but um, I wanna answer your, your second question, which is around like, what are some of the trust assumptions? Yeah, inherently, um, you know, Coinbase is a, a custodial solution and users that, um, you know, place their ETH um, with Coinbase in our accounts, uh, place it within Coinbase's trust, risk, and safety parameters and usability. So, you know, uh, they don't have their private keys, but we kind of like maintain and manage your private keys. Uh, we manage the kind of like staking process. And there's like a specific way that we do that to make sure that, you know, um, Coinbase does this in a, in a very careful and managed method. Um, so, so that's largely the, the, the main trust assumption that's made there. Silly, I want to turn the same question to you and with with uh, Lido because Lido's got, like you said, has nine va validators and it looks uh, looks looking to add a few more in the future. How does Lido go through the selection process of who gets to validate for for Lido and how does Lido also incentivize uptime because uptime is really really important when it comes to uh, in staking as a service. So who are the validators? How is that process decided and how is up uptime uh, incentivized? Mm, so with uh... With Lido, we've got uh, uh, currently nine node operators, and uh, the process we have been used uh, uh, we, we we've been used to two different processes uh, to, to to select them. Uh, one was when we before launch we we talked to uh, every basically good node operators out, uh, operator out there. Uh, um, I'm uh, coming from a, a validator background, so I'm I'm CTO of P2P, a pretty prominent. Uh, uh, a staking provider. Um, so we we talked with uh, just about uh, everyone good uh, and found uh, five uh, 
very good ones who wanted to be part of Lido and start with uh, with us. Uh, it's uh, steak, fish, certos, uh, churros, and uh, staking facilities. Uh, all very good. Uh, some so, some people had legal concerns. Some people had uh, uh, like uh, some some other concerns. Didn't want to be part of liquid staking or something. Uh, so uh, we we've got five very best operators at start. The second leg was when we had a um, a process to select additional uh, a few a few additional ones. Uh, we launched a Google form where people uh, could um, uh, uh, make an admission, and uh, not uh, the existing node operators had uh, like some uh, a kind of uh, council vote on who's uh, going to be in Lido. Um, the next leg is probably be the same one, uh, but that's uh, like a stopgap solution. Uh, we use a community of node operators to select other node operators for now. Uh, that's working out pretty pretty good for us, uh, but that's not a, a permanent solution. Um, why we do that right now uh, that way is uh, uh, that Ether is basically hostage with node operators uh, on Beacon Chain right now. There are no withdrawals. They are not coming uh, for half a year at least. And uh, uh, the, the, the staking is locked. The rewards are locked. Uh, there is no way to uh mm, to do anything is not operators go stroke or out of business or something so uh until the, that hostage period is over uh, the white list is very important to lido um the incentive here to be a good not operator comes from uh like the fact that all of them are very respected and uh, uh very uh very uh, experienced node operators, and they have uh, in in total, I think, a few about short of ten billions in stake in uh, in all the networks they're operating. So they are very experienced. They are very good. They are aligned with the ethos of blockchain and uh, Ethereum in particular, and uh, they want uh, to to maintain reputation for uh, for a long time. So. Uh, that's how it works for now. And I, I want to ask, what's the long-term plan for staking uh, or being a validator or node operator with, with Lido? Uh, are you guys looking to open that up to just a broader, a broader set of participants uh, over the long term? Like what, how, many, uh, how many node operators do you think Lido will have in like you know, one year, five year, 10 years? Uh, so it's a hard problem to design around. Um, we we need to balance the the quality of node operation with uh, permissionless nature of the protocol. Uh, we uh, we are making drafts right now, uh, drafts uh, many of them, and I think it will take like a bit, uh, at least half a year to have uh, something actionable here. Uh, the building blocks we have for for this uh, process is uh, uh, um mostly like the the history uh, of how people operate uh, in Lido. That's one brick. The other is uh, the stakers opinion on operators. So stakers has uh, have to have a say here as well. The people where the, the operator that Ethereum stakers considers to be good ones should be uh, like put uh, uh, more front and center than one they, they don't. Uh, and uh, 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 something like safety model where people can stake their funds uh, with a node operators and say that if if they screw up, uh, that's my money on the line, but I want a share of rewards here. Very cool, very cool. Okay, all right, let's go on to uh, to Rocket Pool as well. Um, so, so Darren, uh, I, I know that Rocket Pool's go goal is to open up staking to as many uh, people as possible. Um, so I want to ask you a slightly different question. Who does Rocket Pool really go after? Or who do you guys find in your community that is part of your validator set? And how, do you, how does the Rocket Pool system incentivize uptime? So yeah, we're permissionless. So anyone can, can be a node operator. Um, but we have kind of rational incentives. So our node operators have skin in the game. They have 16 ETH of their own funds uh, earning rewards. 
So they want to maximize their return. And so consequently, they are maximizing staker returns as well. Um, they, it's an equal amount essentially um, between uh, stake, the, the amount that they are owning, the amount that they have of their own funds and the amount that they get from the pool. So what we get is a, a natural alignment of incentives. So they uh, essentially it ensures that they uh, perform well. So I want to turn this uh, to kind of the the staked ETH token, right? It's like the idea of tokenizing staked ETH, tokenizing departments, this uh, tokenizing deposits. This is a superpower of Ethereum, right? Um, uh, you know, we're all familiar with the article "Superfluid Collateral," and all collateral has become on Ethereum somewhat superfluid in that it can be used in all sorts of DeFi applications. Um, so. The token, it seems, the staked ETH token starts to become much more important. And Darren, you mentioned that um, Rocket Pool has something called R ETH. I'm curious how R ETH might differentiate itself from other um, staked ETH tokens, if at all. And just in general, your thoughts on how this landscape will will play out. Will there just be a ton of different? Um, versions of, of staked ETH tokens in the wild, or would this consolidate to um, a few, or will we have like wrapped versions that contain multiple? How wild and crazy is this going to get, and how is it going to evolve? Yeah, so eventually you'll be able to use our ETH across the entire kind of DeFi landscape. So yeah, liquidity pools, lending protocols, yield farming strategies, uh, our ETH derivatives, and all of all that crazy stuff that we haven't invented yet. Uh, that's 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 all out there. Um, but a big difference, I guess, uh, the big differentiator, I guess, with Arif is its design. So it doesn't rely on balance rebasing to deliver rewards. So the amount of Arif is actually static, but um, we have this ever increasing exchange rate, which accomplishes essentially the same thing, but it has some significant benefits. So first of all, it is much more compatible with exchanges and other protocols um, who are not really expecting balance rebasing. Um, that's basically updating the, the token balance automatically on like a daily or, or a daily basis, essentially. Ample Forth um, or Yam sec- followed this model as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, and second of all, um, there's, there's a concern in our community around the tax implications of owning these tokens. And the Arif design is much easier to track um, from a tax perspective because reward, rewards are not continuously being pushed and um, creating these taxable events. So obviously every tax jurisdiction is different. So get some professional advice. Um, but in general, if people want to have questions about Arif and how it works, uh, we're happy to answer them in our Discord. Uh, Vasily- that's essentially the difference. Vasily, uh, I want to give credit to, to Lido as the, actually the only project that actually has a staked ETH token out there in the wild. So I want to get to you. But, but first, uh, Ryan already brought up uh, Dan uh, Ellitzer's uh, Superfluid Collateral article. Another article that Dan Ellitzer wrote was the death of Ethereum. And death was actually D-E-T-H. And he, stand, uh, he stood at D for delegated ETH. And this was actually a possible scenario that Dan illustrated in this article that, well, uh, if there is a staked ETH tokens out in the wild, like uh, Lido has uh, staked ETH, Rocket Pool has our ETH, and then in theory, any centralized exchange like Coinbase or Kraken could issue their own like delegated ETH, except there's this concept of liquidity begetting liquidity. Uh, And so while there might be many, many staked ETH token, you know, staked ETH derivative tokens out there, it's likely that uh, you know only a handful or maybe just one really just becomes the dominant form of staked ETH collateral in DeFi. Largely, kind of how we see USDC is the uh, the dominant you know stablecoin in DeFi. Uh, and so, Ejaz, my my question to you is that why will the death of Ethereum not happen uh, if if Coinbase does actually absorb a lot of <laughs> ETH? And I'm assuming, and also baked into this question is is Coinbase going to issue a staked ETH token? And then also, if they do, why will it, would it be not the death of Ethereum? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, so let's touch on um, wrapped ETH2 first, right? So I think 
firstly, I'll say I, I got to be got to be careful um, what I say. But um, I think firstly, I'll say we definitely intend on offering liquidity for our users. Right. I think it's a core component for our staking experience that users are able to. Uh, withdraw, send, or trade their assets. And ETH2, of course, is unique uh, in that the transition to proof of stake is phased, right? So uh, there's a lockup period, as it were, right now. In terms of how, uh, we've been and still exploring a number of options for enabling liquidity. And the wrapped ETH2 token is one of them. Another option that you could consider as well is uh, something along the lines of like an internal order book, right, of sorts, where users that have a staked ETH2 position could potentially trade out of that position with someone who wants to enter that position, right? And to be honest, there's pros and cons between all of these options, right? Uh, for example, an internal order book might be simpler to implement um, and use, but it makes it so that stakers can't move their stake off platform, right? Because there's no token. Uh, a wrapped ETH2 asset, on the other hand, is, as you said, and as Dan uh, Elitzer says in his article, much better capital efficiency as you can hold it, take it off platform, use it in DeFi protocols. But I would say trickier to implement technically uh, and compliantly with a holistic uh, product experience. So, so that's the way we're kind of like thinking about liquidity, very important um, and, and focusing down onto a solution now as, as we've been kind of looking into that. And then in terms of like, was your question, David, around why it wouldn't be the, the death of Ethereum? Uh, do you mind helping me understand that, that last part? Right. So uh, the concept, the idea, the thought pro thought process is that uh, all of these liquidity st uh, staked ETH uh, tokens will compete for liquidity. There will be one dominant winner. If that one dominant winner is a centralized exchange, then we have one centralized mm. exchange growing. And gr why would you come and stake your ETH in any other platform if you know you you want to get liquidity on that? So you choose the platform that has the best liquidity on that staked ETH. If that's Coinbase, then that's a centralization factor onto one centralized exchange. Yeah, um, good point. Uh, I guess the way that I'm viewing it is I I honestly, and, and this is my own opinion, I, I honestly don't think there is a world where it's necessarily just going to be one staked ETH derivative um, that kind of rules all. And uh, the reason for that is I think optionality is important, right? Um, like if you ask yourself, why do people use USDC uh, over DAI? Or which is like you know theoretically a more decentralized stable coin, right? There are different use, uses and purposes for that, right? Whether that token is used as collateral to back a certain thing, uh, whether you use it as collateral in Aave to to kind of like pull out credit on that, or whether you use it for something else, um, you know, it, it depends on the user and the use case in particular. And then in terms of liquidity, uh, I think it'll you know there's a high chance that it plays out quite similarly to to stable coins if I'm honest, David, right? So. Uh, you could have a dominant centralized exchange that has a wrapped ETH2 token, but you could also have a decentralized version, you know, whether that's the likes of what Rocket Pool are doing or what Lido is doing as well. So I think that optionality is important. I don't think liquidity uh, would primarily be an issue there, in, in my opinion. Vasily, as the uh, representative of the team with the only actual staked ETH token out in the wild, Tell us about that. What's that like? Is the uh, Lido state ETH token, is that collateral in any application? What's the, the strategy behind growing liquidity? Overall, what is the uh, approach towards, you know, growing the, the market cap of uh, Lido state ETH token? Uh, uh, well, one correction that we are not the only uh, liquid uh, stake, uh, stake, stake token. There are, uh, like, I think uh, four more. Oh, wow. uh, we are dominant, uh, like seventy-five percent of the of the liquid staking market, but not uh, not the only one, and uh, the the rest uh, has uh, a lot of ETH in total as well. So um, there is stakewise and STKR and the credit is uh, where's credit you. We are not the only one. So um, uh, we are honestly in the bucket of uh, there. There will be like a dominant. Uh, 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 liquid staking token here and uh, the runners up and uh, that uh, the dominant token can change but the equilibrium here if there is there is a domination uh, on the market because that's how the uh, these things work when when the products are not uh, very differentiated and liquid staking tokens are not very differentiated to most users uh, they, they they want uh, 
an adder with with some uh, staking rewards on top, and uh, every every liquid staking token provides more or less that. Um, when they are not sufficiently differentiated, the uh, the one that has a slight edge will get used more. And slight edge may, may, might be liquidity, might be uh, like better rewards or something, but. Uh, uh, there is a place for 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 domination here, I think so. And then the liquidity uh, improves. Uh, uh, that that uh, we we have a positive feedback loop here. So I I'm pretty sure that uh, the um, the domination uh, the, 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 this will be a market where the winner takes most, and the winner can change at at times. Uh, but uh, the the equilibrium is uh, one dominant coin and other. Uh, less prominent. Uh, guys, what a what a what a fascinating panel so far. Diversity of approaches, also diversity of perspectives on some of these issues. Guys, we have a few more things to cover that you are not going to want to miss. We're going to talk about MEV. We're going to talk about uh, insurance. We're going to talk about what keeps these panelists up at night when it comes to staking. So a lot more to unpack here. If you are enjoying this conversation, if you want more bankless panels and you want reminders sent, notifications sent, make sure you like and subscribe to this channel right now. Just hit that like button, subscribe. We are going to get to the sponsors and then be back with these panelists in just a moment. But thanks to the sponsors that made this episode possible. Bankless is proud to be supported by Uniswap. Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum, which is what Ryan and I call a money robot. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. Something brand new in the Uniswap ecosystem is the Uniswap Grants program is now accepting applications for grants. We have been saying this for a while and we'll say it again. DAOs have money and they are in need of labor. If you think that you have something to contribute to the Uniswap DAO, apply for a grant to Uniswap. Just look at the size of the Uniswap treasury. It's almost $3 billion. This mountain of capital is looking for labor. Do you have something of value to contribute to the Uniswap DAO? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at unigrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. That's exactly what we did to get Uniswap to be a sponsor for Bankless, and you can do the same for your project. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. The Aave protocol is a decentralized liquidity protocol on Ethereum, which allows users to supply and borrow certain crypto assets. Aave version 2 has a ton of cool features that makes using the Aave protocol even more powerful. With Aave, you can leverage the full power of DeFi money Legos, yield, and composability all in one application. On Aave, there are a ton of assets that you can supply to the protocol in order to gain yield, and all of those same assets can also be borrowed from the protocol if you have supplied collateral. Here you can see me borrowing 200 USDC against my portfolio of a number of different DeFi tokens in ETH. I'll choose a variable interest rate because it's a lower rate than the stable interest rate option, but I could choose the stable interest rate option if I wanted to lock in that interest rate in permanently. V2 also features the ability for users to swap collateral without having to withdraw their assets, trade them on Uniswap, and then deposit them back into Aave. With Aave, users can do this in one seamless transaction, saving you time and gas costs. Check out the power of Aave at Aave.com. That's A-A-V-E dot com. All right, guys, we are back with this excellent panelist, ETH staking providers. We've got Coinbase, we've got Lido, we've got Rocket Pool. These guys are the best in the biz. We've covered so much so far. One topic we haven't addressed and we absolutely need to is this topic of MEV in an ETH staking world. This is no longer minor extractable value. This is maximal ex extractable value. This is basically the idea of um, being able to front run transactions because validators have the God mode superpower of transaction ordering. Uh, they can order transactions and benefit certain parties over another, maybe receive a fee 
for, for providing that transaction ordering uh, benefit. This is almost like a, um, oh, we've talked about this so much on, on Bankless. We, we've talked about this as sort of a, a Moloch problem. We, we've talked about this as, as kind of a, a, hum, like a coordination problem. It's something that's very pernicious, pernicious on Ethereum. I want to start maybe with, uh, with EJAS. Um, tell me about MEV. Thus, the structural issue that, that you think um, staking service providers are going to have around this and how Coinbase plans to approach it. And the last thing I'll say about this is this could really impact the yields that mm -hmm. um, stakers get. If, if one of you guys, one of you service providers are able to extract more MEV and give that back to stakers, you're going to be able to offer much more competitive yields and rates. So what's Coinbase's approach to MEV jazz? Yeah, um, really, really interesting question. So I think, like, firstly, I think MEV could be a huge opportunity for us and for Coinbase, um, but it also comes with many interesting challenges that we need to consider, right? So um, given Coinbase's position, um, you know, running you know, loads of validators for a number of, of proof of stake networks. Coinbase now has the opportunity to capture MEV, like you said, right? And this revenue stream could potentially be substantial. Um, as an example, I think uh, some experts have predicted that MEV after Ethereum proof of stake uh, merge has happened could enable ETH2 validators to increase their earnings by as much as like 60 to 300%, right? And those all sound like kind of like uh, DeFi summer type APYs, right? And I'm pretty sure it would <laughs> consolidate. It would consolidate down um, uh, pretty succinctly. But you know, um, you know, there's definitely a marginal opportunity to to increase the APYs. So that's one core incentive, right? And to your point, Ryan, like uh, if one provider does this, right, now there becomes a competitive disparity between other providers, and so they might want to do it, right? And and so there's a number of options to consider uh, for how we proceed with MEV. Everything from you know creating proprietary strategies to maybe even purposefully opting out of MEV and maintaining a neutral stance. At present, the full scope and implications, in our opinion, are unclear. But we're working towards we're working pretty hard to come towards a, a conclusion here. That being said, what I can say is our intention is to pass these MEV rewards through to our customers. Um, another interesting thought that I had is like. Um, there's also just some really interesting concepts and paths that you can consider for uh, like different products that we have, right? Uh, so let's say we could use MEV, let's say hypothetically um, for Coinbase wallet users, right? So Coinbase wallet is like a non-custodial option where users can kind of like hold assets there and interact with, with different dApps. Um, we could theoretically have like something like front running protection, right? So let's say for example, a user wants to send a Uniswap transaction instead of going to a public mempool, you know, you could go via Coinbase and the block that we propose and, and a private mempool. So some really interesting thoughts there. Um, we are still trying to nail down what our proposed kind of like solution strategy might be, but it's just a fascinating topic to learn about, to be honest. I want to throw that same question to Vasily and, and Lido. Vasily, can you kind of uh, speak to the validators that Lido currently has and, and works with and how does, uh, how, how does the, the validators there, uh, are they equipped to be able to capture as much MEV as possible? And what are the intentions? Uh, can you speak to the intentions of the validators and how it relates to the state ETH token? Um, so you, you can, uh, in, in that regard, you can think of uh, LIDO the, like more or less the node operators union. Uh, so organized not node operators. Uh, I think it's pretty likely that uh, LIDAR will approach, uh, will adopt a unified approach to MEV and uh, enforce it across the, uh, all the validators uh, because that's uh, like in, in the best interest of uh, both node operators and users uh, and stakers. Uh, so um, um, I think that uh, MEV ex extraction, actual extraction is something that not operators are not equipped to, to, to make themselves because it's something that, that that's basically a, a, a field, a, a job where you uh, like walk without sleep for three months straight and then you burn out. Uh, and uh, not operators are like the, uh, the, the long game players. They, 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 they uh, play the game for, uh, for years and uh, decades. Like. So it will be probably uh, 
looking like right now with uh, mining pools and uh, and flashbots. So there will be a, a service providers that uh, handles the the extraction, the 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 gritty uh, parts of it, and node operators will be. Uh, like doing the high level things like setting it up and maintaining and monitoring and maybe uh, 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 like doing the selection of the um, service providers but the, the service itself uh, should be uh, provided by the very competent and uh, people who, who don't need to sleep ever like <laughs> yeah. uh, there is not, not not a lot of them right now I think that's uh, that's where it ends up for, for most of the um, of the not operators and uh, it uh, it's more or less uh, we, what we see with uh, mining and MEV uh, same, same thing I think will have a mistake with the one important uh, difference uh, well maybe two, impor uh, two important things that will change from uh, on transition from mining to, to staking and MEV one is that staking is much more aligned uh, make, makes the uh, alignment between uh, ethereum holders and uh, uh, extractable value extractors much more uh, strong so uh, it's essentially the stakers who decide uh, how mev will be extracted right now and stakers are ETH holders and uh, unlike hash power uh, uh, owners uh, currently who are uh, well they mostly are Ethereum holders too, either holders too, but uh, in much less uh, amounts and quantities. So uh, the value line is much stronger here after 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 the stake uh, the staking uh, after the merge basically, and that will change the landscape because uh, that changes the quotient, and that means that um, over extraction of MOV will be no longer in the best interested of the um, of the validators so that's that's one thing and the other that staking will provide uh, multi-block uh, reorganizations and multi-block uh, um, uh, MEV extraction right now that the only feasible uh, way to uh, to do it is uh, within within the block with one block as an atomic think what after the merge is in uh, we will know the schedule for for block producers and the block producers will will, will know that oh okay i've got three blocks in a row i can uh, like reorganize or organize the transaction for three blocks in a row straight and that changes uh, uh, the opportunities very significantly does that make them the opportunities more like does that increase the opportunities for you know, providers and in which way does it change it significantly um so right now a lot of protocols are designed with a, with a thought in mind that the only atomic thing uh, there there is in ethereum is a block and between blocks you uh, ah. uh there there is no sure way to, to ensure that uh, you've got three blocks in a row for example uh, uniswap uh, or based oracles uh twops that uh, uh, they take the last uh, price of asset in a block as a, as a data point. If you've got only one block to produce and you don't know who, who, who has to produce the, the next block, you can't manipulate that because the next block can be your adversary. And uh, uh, if you like, for example, unbalanced price, uh, like uh, put either to, uh, to like $200 to, to force liquidation, the next block uh, producer can uh, like buy it out and uh, uh, have you uh, like uh, take take all your money here, but uh, if you have two blocks in a row, you can in one block unbalance price get at what point uh, on chain, and then use that what point to to force liquidation. Uh, so when you can reliably string two blocks in a row, the Uniswap two oracles are no longer as secure as they used to be. Uh, and yeah, so many protocols are built on the assumption that one block is an atomic thing that can happen, and that will be no longer true, and that makes uh, that MEV more uh, more dangerous. So what's interesting is, on the one hand, like the MEV becomes more dangerous in a fully merged ETH2, and some DeFi protocols are going to have to redesign around these new parameters. But on the other hand, some of what you said made me actually uh, optimistic, Vasily, right? You said that 
basically you think that node operators won't try to um, extract MEV themselves, but this will be somewhat commoditized. And you know they might plug into solutions like like um, Flashbots, which is actually I think a, um, a a a good setup for minimizing the the damaging impacts of MEV. And you also noted that hey, validators aren't like miners; they are long term incented toward the health and decentralization of Ethereum. So both of those things uh, made me optimistic. You know, Dar Darren, what's what's your take on all of this? Uh, MEV, what's Rocket Pool's design parameters, and what's Rocket Pool's take? So we we've taken a look at this. We've we've done considerable amount of research uh, into this recently, and it spurred a conversation within our community and and also uh, some of the Ethereum core devs as well. So we've uh, recently posted a medium article about our position, but. Um, Actually, first of all, I just want to touch on something that Vasily said. So uh, he was kind of saying about the the blocks, how their blocks are produced. So decentralization is especially important uh, when you um, have MEV, because with centralization, you the chances of collusion between validators within an epoch. This is Ethereum based uh, kind of proof of con proof of stake. Um, actually intensifies kind of the potential for evil. So having uh, a large centralized provider, having lots of validators means they're more likely to have multiple blocks within a uh, epoch, which means that they can actually do more damage than uh, either kind of um, on purpose or, or by accident. Um, so our position is basically that we wish MEV didn't exist, um, but if it's going to be part of proof of um, stake, then uh, we can't really ignore it. Uh, we it, we'd prefer it to be democratized, transparent, and ideally somewhat responsible. Uh, we're collaborating with Flashbots to see uh, what that looks like, um, and we've got kind of some ideas around some mechanisms to incentivize the fair sharing of MEV rewards with our stakers. So our, our, our ETH holders. Uh, essentially, MEV post-merge is a very emerging space at the moment. So uh, it's certainly something that's going to kind of develop over time. Hey, David, you're muted. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, importantly, with MEV and Rocket Pool, MEV goes to the actual person that is running the node, right? Not the actual validators or not, not the ETH stakers, but the people actually taking in the ETH and actually running the node. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail with how Rocket Pool plans to incentivize the Rocket Pool node operators to put the earned ETH back into the overall pool of, of Rocket Pool earnings, which ultimately goes into the R ETH token? Yeah, so it's kind of broken down into two parts. There's like a detection mechanism and uh, the actual incentive. Um, so, um, and we've got both incentives and the incentives, I guess. So the detection mechanism is essentially this collaboration with Flashbots in the sense that uh, you'll only kind of be able to do MEV through them. Um, with the incentivization and de-incentivization, essentially, if you do MEV outside of that, uh, and which means that you haven't shared with the uh, with the RE holders, then um, we have a, uh, a slashing mechanism that enables us to kind of slash them based on based on the activity. Uh, we're also looking at other. We're also looking at the carrot as well as the stick. So we're also looking at ways to incentivize the sharing as well as this this kind of slashing. Does, does the misalignment between Rocket Pool ETH stakers and Rocket Pool node operators, that misalignment with MEV, there's a little bit of, of you know, the, the node operators want to capture more of the MEV and kind of want to hide, hide the MEV that they capture under the table while the stakers are like, hey, we want all the MEV as possible. Does that misalignment uh, concern you at all? Uh, not on the surface. Like a lot of the people that we've spoken to uh, would actually do the right thing. Um, it's just the fact that because we're a decentralized protocol, we have to design for uh, the for people defecting essentially, for people not doing not doing um, uh, not doing what the protocol requires of them. So 
we have to design that in, in into place. But speaking to a lot of people, um, if they're operating within the Rockable protocol, they're willing to do the right thing. They're willing to share it with the um, the Iris stakers because they know they're going to get significant benefits from operating within the Rockable protocol. Um, one of the incentives actually that we're looking at doing is essentially like a staking um, or a smoothing pool. So uh, very similar. So MEV is very similar to um, proof of work in the sense that you can you can get these big payouts every now and again, um, uh, but you can also get kind of small uh, payouts. So it's very inconsistent. And so what we do is we put this um, smoothing pool together so that we can actually even that out. So instead of having like a uh, getting a, a lower um, kind of return, they actually get a higher return because they're um, it's a it's a kind of a flat return rather than this kind of go for gold um, sort of scenario. So from a long term perspective, uh, it, that's much better. Guys, this has been a just a, a fantastic panel, um, mind blowing on a on a number of levels. Uh, Shout out to the YouTube chat playing the drinking game <laughs> while we while we have this panel. <laughs> yeah, as we're saying keywords, I think people are are drinking. I don't know what the keywords are, David. What are they? <laughs> the, whoever, I think the words are private keys, trustlessness, and decentralization, which are really aggressive words to play a drinking game with. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to avoid those words in the last question, so that so that people aren't too intoxicated while they absorb this information. <laughs> um, so the last question to the panelists, and I want to pack two questions in one because I, I think this is important. Um, the, the, the first is, tell us what keeps you up at night with respect to ETH staking. Um, so that's kind of the, the negative, worried side of, of your brain. And then secondly, what's the thing that makes you most optimistic about ETH staking? So that's kind of the the, the bright side. We'll, we'll start with you, Darren. What keeps you up at night? What makes you most optimistic? Uh, so living in Australia means I get kept awake at night a lot, <laughs> talking to the US and, and Europe. But so thank you. Thank you for uh, doing this daytime daytime call. Um, I, I guess getting Rocket Pool to mainnet um, safely and securely, that's the, that's the thing that I am um, very passionate about um, and very... Um, that's the thing that's, that's kind of driving me at the moment. Uh, in the in, in terms of the optimistic side in, for Ethereum, I think Ethereum proof of stake is a fantastic uh, invention and uh, has a, uh, in the broader kind of finance uh, sort of spectrum, has a lot going for it. So um, I think that that um, is, is something that drives me as well, the, the potential, I guess. Vasily, uh, same question for you. What keeps you up at night and what makes you most optimistic about ETH staking? <laughs> so uh, about what, what, what uh, I, I've got like this existential threat of as a uh, tech lead on, on the protocol that has uh, about uh, like 9% of staked ETH in it. Um, I, I when, when when we launched Lido, I, we did a lot of planning for uh, for 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 failure, for bad thing. What what we will do if if there is a disaster? What the recovery process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it turns out we didn't plan for success, right? And <laughs> when in March it hit me that we 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 just very very big already. Uh, we we've got a lot of stake. Uh, how do you keep it safe? How do you keep it aligned with the room? That's uh, that's what uh, what drives me currently. So uh, we've got uh, at at the point where we we are impactful and we we should uh, light that should wield this power well. So that's uh, that's what I'm uh, working for right now. Where's the optimism coming from? Are you optimistic about that on the other side too? Mm, what, what, one thing that is actually uh, I think uh, underappreciated, underplayed right now about uh, the merge and it taken uh, taken off is that Ethereum holders will have a much higher uh, political weight right now in the uh, in the Ethereum governance. They are now not just holders; they uh, the stakers are are making Ethereum secure, and they are taking the the role that uh, that miners uh, used to have uh, and still have, and that makes. Uh, 
well, th that's a tectonic shift that is not uh, um, still uh, processed, I think, by the community, but it will change how Ethereum operates. Uh, and I think it will change the, how Ethereum operates for good. Ijaz, take us home with this question. What keeps you up at night? What makes you most optimistic? Well, yeah, I mean, aside from this uh, amazing podcast that's keeping both you and I up, Ryan, um, <laughs> on the on the East Coast, um, listen, there's, there's a few things. Like, um, one of them is is a topic we've already covered, which is MEV. Like, I, I just think it's it's such a fascinating development that's playing out, and you know, probably has the potential to be one of the most controversial for Ethereum, uh, depending on how we all approach this as a community. And I think. Like that being said, it's such an interesting challenge with so many different possible outcomes. So, you know, I've been trying my best to, to wrap my head around uh, the latest developments uh, around that. And then I think like secondly is um, probably echoing the city's point. Um, I sometimes like, before I'm going to bed, literally I'm thinking about, you know, how much we have, uh, you know, staked and, you know, I can't be mentioning figures and stuff, but it, it, it's just, you know, it, it's a significant amount. It's a non-trivial amount and you, it, it just can't help but keep you awake and thinking about how we can maintain that infrastructure, about how we make sure that this is done in the most optimized and best way for our users. Um, now, if I were to flip that over and look at like the optimistic side, I mean, guys, like similar to you guys, I've, I've been an Ethereum fanboy for years now. Um, in my prior role at Consensus, I used to be on the ground, like working uh, alongside a lot of these different um, dApps and protocols. And actually one of the main reasons why I moved to Coinbase is, uh, okay, I've seen all the awesome innovation that's been built out. How do I enable it in such a way that like my mom who thinks I work on magical internet money and she's, you know, she's kind of not wrong, uh, can access and use all of this, right? Uh, and I think like, you know, ETH2 staking in general is just one major way to be able to do that, right? We're seeing Ethereum's decentralized ethos and vision come to life right now. And being able to empower that is definitely motivation enough, I think. Ijaz, Vasily, Darren, thanks for, so much for joining us. This has been a fantastic panel. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you for having us. Bankless Nation, ETH the internet bond, ETH the triple point asset, ETH becoming a capital asset. These are regular themes. Staking enables all of that. Such an exciting topic. We hope you got a lot out of this panel. I certainly did. I know David did. Of course, risks and disclaimers. ETH is volatile. ETH is risky. So is staking. All of crypto is risky. Uh, you could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Also, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this panel. Make sure you do that. Take care, guys. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks.